Hi class, welcome to our almost last lecture. I think we have one more to go, um, but today we're gonna be talking about non-malignant hematological disorders. So we'll talk about blood today. And here are the learning objectives for this lecture. And this is our agenda. So we got a lot to talk about and it's gonna be fun time. So hang tight and enjoy the ride. Here we go. So hematological disorders, these can vary widely in etiology and manifestations, some being malignant, but in this section, we're really gonna be talking about those non-malignant. And as we go through this, um, just be thinking about what red blood cells do for our body and how we would manage these disorders and what nursing interventions would be required um, if there was a problem with those. So let's start by talking about anemia, which is a condition characterized by lower than normal hemoglobin concentration and fewer than normal red blood cells. Um, which are circulating in our blood. And this results obviously in low oxygen consumption to our tissues because our red blood cells are important for carrying oxygen to all of our body. And so this can result in a variety of signs and symptoms. Um, anemia is classified in several ways, most often by decreased number of erythrocytes with hypoproliferation which means decreased production of red blood cells. Um, it could also be hemolysis, which is destruction of red blood cells, and then loss of cells through bleeding. And we're gonna go through disorders where each of these classifications are shown. So general clinical manifestations that are common to all anemias are depicted in this slide, and symptoms can depend on the severity of the anemia and also the rapidity with which the anemia has developed. Um, it can also be about the duration of the anemia, how long they've had it, um, and then metabolic requirements of that person. Um, and then there's the presence of other conditions such as cardiac or pulmonary diseases and complications or future or um, related features of the condition that um, produce the anemia in the first place. In general, the quicker the anemia develops, the more severe the symptoms will be, whereas when anemia develops over a period of months, for example, when women have heavy menses, sometimes they'll be asymptomatic or they'll have vague symptoms um, before we diagnose them with anemia. Complications of severe anemia can include heart failure, paresthesias, and delirium. So there's a ton of studies that can be done to determine the type and the cause of the anemia. Um, initial evaluation would be to get hemoglobin and hematocrit, reticulocyte count, red blood cell indices like um, mean corpuscular vo volume, um, MCV and RDW, which stands for red cell distribution width. And these are looking at the sizes of those erythrocytes. Other studies to look into anemia deeper would be iron studies like serum iron level, um, total iron binding capacity, um, percent saturation, and ferritin, vitamin B12, folate, haptoglobin, um, in general, a normal value for adults is 40 to 200 for haptoglobin. And if your levels are lower, it really means that you have hemolytic anemia in which your red blood cells are prematurely destroyed. Um, and an undetectable haptoglobin level is almost always due to hemolytic anemia. We also can look at erythropoietin um, we can do a bone marrow aspiration um, to confirm anemia diagnosis, um, and then colonoscopy and endoscopy to look for bleeding. So let's start with hypoproliferative anemias, and these occur when the bone marrow 
produce inadequate amounts of erythrocytes. So that decrease in erythrocyte production results in a low or inappropriately normal reticulocyte, um, immature red blood cell count. Some causes of hyperproliferative anemias can include bone marrow damage from chemicals like chemotherapy or medication, um, lack of important factors to promote erythrocyte production, such as erythropoietin, or lack of nutrients like iron or vitamin B12 and folic acid. Hypoproliferative anemias include iron deficiency anemia, anemia, anemias in renal disease, anemia of inflammation, aplastic anemia, and megaloblastic anemia. So let's start by talking about iron deficiency anemia, which occurs when the intake of dietary iron is inadequate for synthesis of hemoglobin. And our bodies are able to store about a quarter to a third of our iron requirements. And it's really not until those stores are depleted that iron deficiency anemia develops. And this is the most common type of anemia in all age groups. And it's the most common form of anemia worldwide. And it affects as many as one out of eight people. And it's especially prevalent in developing countries where there's a chronic lack of iron sources along with blood loss through intestinal parasites. So the most common cause of iron deficiency anemia is blood loss. And this should always be considered as the cause until that is ruled out. Clinical manifestations of iron deficiency anemia include those general symptoms of anemia that we just talked about. Um, severe iron deficiency anemia, clients may have a smooth red tongue, they might have brittle or rigid nails, they could have pica, and angular chelosis, or those dried reddened areas on the sides of their lips. Um, a definitive method of testing for iron deficiency anemia is bone marrow aspiration, but many times we can diagnose it through blood tests and then clinical manifestations. And there's actually pretty few patients who undergo bone marrow aspiration for testing for iron deficiency anemia because one, it's costly, and two, it can be very painful. Um, so lab values that we might look at include a complete blood count. So we'll look at hemoglobin specifically, we'll look at ferritin, and we'll look at transport protein supplying the marrow um, with iron, TBC, TIBC. Um, they would also see mean corpuscular volume and that will be low in relation to the hemoglobin level. And that means that the person's producing really small and fewer red blood cells than necessary. So how do we manage iron deficiency anemia? Well, we need iron, so we need to supplement with iron. And this can be done orally with ferrous sulfate or ferrous gluconate along with iron rich foods. And this could take months to replenish. Um, or if they don't tolerate the oral um, ferrous sulfate or gluconate very well, um, then we can give them IV iron. And there's also parenteral iron formulations and that um, these are available like iron sucrose or ferric gluconate, and these can be given through an IV. And the preparations would replete iron stores more quickly than oral intake, of course. So nursing management um, includes education on oral intake of iron if they're taking them. So iron needs to be taken on an empty stomach, so at least one hour before or two hours after eating, preferably with a source of vitamin C, and that is to help increase absorption. Um, we want them to avoid dairy intake, which can inhibit iron absorption. And that oral iron can cause GI distress, which it can take a gradual adjustment for the body to just get used to. So we want to educate the client that they'll also 
might have darker colored stools and they can often appear black and that is just a normal finding when taking iron. Um, oral iron preparations that are liquid can stain the teeth so we want to educate our clients about that and to rinse their mouth out thoroughly after taking it. We also want to avoid antacids because they inhibit absorption. Here are some foods with iron that we can educate our clients to include in their diet when they have iron deficiency anemia. And that was it. So let's talk about megaloblastic anemias now. So these are anemias that cause the same bone marrow and peripheral blood changes because they're both needed for normal DNA synthesis. And when there is a folate or B12 deficiency, their erythrocytes will be abnormally large. And this is why they're termed megaloblastic anemias. This is because when DNA synthesis is impaired, the cell cycle can't progress from the G2 growth stage to mitosis. Um, and this leads to continuing cell growth without division and that presents as macrocytosis. So the mean corpuscular volume of, um, on our CBC will be very elevated with megaloblastic anemias, and that is why um, these types of anemias develop slowly over time, so many patients um, won't have symptoms right away. Folate deficiency. So folic acid is stored in the body as compounds known as folates. Um, our stores are much smaller than vitamin B12, um, so it won't take as long to deplete those stores, especially if intake of folate, folate is deficient. And folate-rich foods include liver, green leafy vegetables, peas, eggs, beans. Um, the most common way we see folate deficiency, though, in nursing at least, is when we have alcohol use disorder or chronic liver disease, and sometimes in pregnant women. Um, you may also see these with celiac disease um, have folate deficiency. So serum levels of folic acid will be evaluated and then treatment will include oral folic acid replacement. And in cases where we have a client with absorption problems or they're unable to take them orally, we can give them IM injections. And then we have vitamin B12 deficiency, and this can occur in several different ways. So it can be inadequate dietary intake for those who follow like a vegan diet. It can be impaired absorption from the GI tract, which is the most common, um, especially in older adults. It can also occur in patients with inflammatory bowel disease, bariatric surgery, GI surgery in general, um, the use of metformin, chronic use of histamine blockers or antacid or PPIs, and overall having like absence of intrinsic factor um, that will definitely impair B12 absorption. And when um, this occurs, we refer to it as pernicious anemia. So that lack of intrinsic factor is called pernicious anemia. And intrinsic factor binds to vitamin B12 in the gastric mucosa and it transports it to the ileum where it can then be absorbed. Um, without that intrinsic factor, someone cannot absorb vitamin B12. So they need IM injections instead. And usually we'll start them weekly and then monthly, but they'll have to have vitamin B12 injections for the rest of their lives. Those who have vitamin B12 deficiency or pernicious anemia will have gradual clinical manifestations. Um, those with pernicious anemia will develop a smooth red tongue and they might have mild di diarrhea. Um, they can be extremely pale, especially their mucous membranes. And they'll also have paresthesias in the extremities, especially in the lower extremities. They might also have difficulty maintaining their balance, and without treatment of B12, this can lead to heart failure. So we definitely don't want that. All right, that was quick. The 
last three. So let me just take a drink here. Okay, so let's talk about aplastic anemia. So this is a life-threatening condition in which the T cells attack the bone marrow. Um, and remember, we talked about the T cells um, when we talked about HIV. Um, and these help to protect our body from foreign invaders. But now they're attacking our bone marrow. And that creates bone marrow failure, which then results in pancytopenia. And pancytopenia is when we have anemia, neutropenia, and thrombocytopenia. And this is terrifying because our patient is at high, 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 high risk for bleeding and infection. So with aplastic anemia, many times it can be idiopathic where we don't know why the patient has this. Um, the most common cause of aplastic anemia is from your immune system attacking the stem cells, mainly those T lymphocytes in your bone marrow. Um, other factors that can injure the bone marrow and affect blood cell production include radiation and chemotherapy agents. And we're definitely gonna be talking about this again um, in the next lecture, which um, we talk about cancer. So onset of symptoms for this condition are typically insidious. Sometimes complications that stem from bone marrow failure will occur before the diagnosis is even made. Um, complications with aplastic anemia that stand out are definitely infection and bleeding. But they can also have symptoms of anemia, fatigue, paler dyspnea, um, bruising associated with thrombocytopenia. And they can also have retinal hemorrhages, which is just, that is the top left hand corner picture. And then the purpura is the bottom left. So assessment and diagnostics. Blood levels will show low neutrophils, hemoglobin, and platelet count, and that is pancytopenia. Um, sometimes, even though the client is at increased risk of bleeding and infection, they will go ahead and do a bone marrow biopsy, um, and this will show hypoplastic or aplastic bone marrow, which means there's very little or no blood cells within it, and it's just often replaced with fat. So, medical management. So aplastic anemia, it can be successfully treated in many cases. Um, so for clients who are 60 years of age or younger that are otherwise healthy, hemato oh, wow. hematopoietic stem cell transplant um, from a compatible donor can cure aplastic anemia. Um, in other situations, there's a treatment with immunosuppressive therapy using um, ATG and androgens or cyclosporine in combination. So ATG is obtained through rabbits or horses immunized with human T lymphocytes, and it works by killing specific cells in your immune system cause T lymphocytes, the cells that are attacking those bone marrow cells in aplastic anemia. So this allows um, someone with aplastic anemia, their bone marrow to go ahead and rebuild its supply of bone marrow stem cells, and it causes blood counts to then go up. Um, cyclosporine, this prevents T lymphocytes from becoming active. Um, once the T lymphocytes are turned off by the cyclosporine, they stop attacking stem cells in the bone marrow. Um, so that will allow them to grow back and start making blood, um, new blood cells again. And then something we also need to be aware of is treating um, aggressively um, those kind of opportunistic infections that can develop from aplastic anemia. So those bacterial or fungal infections. And then we aggressively want to treat bleeding if that is occurring as well. So nursing management, we obviously um, priorities are going to be watching for signs and symptoms of infection or bleeding, especially someone with a low-grade fever. This should be considered in someone with aplastic anemia a medical emergency because they have such a low um, immune system.
Many times clients will be in protective isolation, so neutropenic precautions. And we want to monitor any side effects of therapy, including hypersensitivity reactions. Um, we don't want them to stop their immunosuppressive therapy, therapy abruptly. Um, we can educate them on drug to drug interactions with ATG. And those who are on long-term cyclosporine therapy, they should be monitored for long-term side effects. Okay, on to hemolytic anemias, where the erythrocytes have a shortened lifespan, and because of that, the number of circulating erythrocytes is, is low. So this results in decreased ox oxygen availability. It causes hypoxia, which stimulates an increase in erythropoietin um, from the kidneys to try to compensate. Um, so the release of erythropoietin then stimulates the bone marrow to produce new erythrocytes and release them out into the circulation prematurely as reticulocytes. So if this cycle persists, our hemoglobin is then broken down excessively and it's con converted to bilirubin. And this is where we can send, sometimes see jaundice in patients who have hemolytic anemias. Um, then that bilirubin can congest the liver and the spleen where we might see enlarged liver and spleen. And then finally, it'll be excreted as bile. So let's talk a little bit more about these disorders. So we have sickle cell disease, AKA sickle cell anemia, and then we have G6PD deficiency. So let's start with sickle cell disease. This is an autosomal recessive genetic disorder and it's caused by inheritance of the sickle hemoglobin gene, HBS. This is a molecule that causes the erythrocyte to change its shape from a round um, circle to a half moon when it, it's exposed to low oxygen tension. And because of this defect, those erythrocytes can easily adhere to the walls of blood vessels and they can accumulate and clog an area causing decreased blood flow to the tissues or organs in that region. So when this happens and blood flow is severely reduced, it can cause ischemic um, or infarction of the tissue and it can cause pain, swelling, fever, and this is known as a sickle cell or vaso-occlusive crisis. So with sickle cell disease, um, symptoms can vary. Symptoms and complications are really a result of chronic hemolysis and thrombosis. So patients may present with jaundice, they might have an enlarged face or skull, tachycardia, cardiac murmurs, cardiomegaly, arrhythmias, and heart failure. So sickle cell disease can affect so many different organs in our body, including the spleen, lungs, kidneys, heart, liver, eyes, and our central nervous system, just to name a few. Um, there's a great table in your book on page 920 if you wanted to dive deeper into why this is. Um, but for complications, let's start by talking about sickle cell crisis. There are three types that affect adults, but we're gonna only focus on the most common. So the most common is an acute vaso-occlusive crisis. And this is a very painful condition that happens because of the accumulation of erythrocytes and leukocytes in the microcirculation. And this restricts blood flow to the tissues, causing hypoxia, inflammation, and then necrosis. Um, and then in this type of situation, nursing interventions will focus on managing pain, managing fatigue, preventing and managing infection, promoting coping and education to prevent or diminish symptoms. Acute chest syndrome is another complication with sickle cell disease, and this is associated with high rates of morbid morbidity and mortality. Um, the common Clinical manifestations with acute chest syndrome are fever, respiratory distress, tachypnea, cough, and wheezing. And then we might see new infiltrates on a chest x-ray. And often the cause um, of this are infections with bacteria like chlamydia, pneumonia, mycoplasma, pneumonia, and viruses like influenza. influenza. Um, other causes can include pulmonary thromboembolism, fat embolism, and pulmonary infarction. Um, so medical management will include blood transfusions, 
antibiotics, bronchodilators, inhaled nitric oxide, and mechanical, um, mechanical ventilation when acute respiratory failure occurs. So risk for acute chest syndrome can be reduced through influenza vaccination and pneumococcal vaccination and also use of incentive spirometry during hospitalization with a vaso-occlusive crisis along with blood transfusions perioperatively. Hello. So um, another complication is pulmonary hypertension. This can occur in sickle cell disease because those sickle cells can get stuck in the microvasculature of the lungs and they can start to slowly cut off circulation, which causes infarction of the tissue, increased pulmonary pressure, and then pulmonary hypertension. And this is a common cause of death in those with sickle cell disease because it's hard to diagnose in the early stages. And once it's too far along, the damage is too extensive and it's irreversible. So sickle cell disease patients will have symptoms such as fatigue, dyspnea, exertion, dizziness, chest pain, or syncope. And then strokes can be common. And again, it's because of those sickled cells, they can get stuck in the microvasculature of the central nervous system and they can cause infarctions. Um, reproductive disorders, um, this can be caused by the sickling again um, of the vascular areas of the penis and it can cause pain, it can cause erectile dysfunction and really impotence, unfortunately. So assessment diagnostics, we're gonna be looking at their um, complete blood count. They normally have a uh, normal hemoglobin and hematocrit, um, but with the blood smear, we'll see that sickle cell trait. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. So those who only have sickle cell trait will see a normal hemoglobin hematocrit, where those with sickle cell disease will see um, a low hematocrit in those sickled cells on the blood smear. Sorry, that was confusing. Um, white blood cells and platelets, they're usually elevated and that's due to chronic inflammation. Um, and then abnormal hemoglobin will be found through electrophoresis. This is just a chart where you can see the breakdown of how someone with sickle cell disease would be at increased risk of developing um, those complications that we kind of just went over. So typically those with sickle cell disease are diagnosed in childhood. And you'll be talking about this condition again when you get to pediatrics with Professor Day. So it'll be like a fun review for you. And then treatment of sickle cell disease symptoms is typically aggressive since we really want to get on top of the complications, but there's a few primary treatment options. Um, no, there's none really. Uh, sorry, there's very few. Um, but research is currently being done on trying to figure out um, most, like how we should focus on treatment for sickle cell disease. What we have available right now is hematopoietic stem cell transplant, which involves the transplantation of multipotent hemo, um, hematopoietic stem cells. And usually these are derived from bone marrow, peripheral blood, or umbilical cord blood in order to replicate inside of a patient and produce additional normal blood cells. But this is usually only available to a small subset of affected sickle cell disease patients because there's a lack of compatible donors, or it's because there's too extensive organ damage already and they're not a candidate. Um, pharmacological therapy using hydroxyurea, which is a chemotherapeutic agent that helps to increase levels of fetal hemoglobin and decrease the formulation of sickled cells. And it's the only current FDA approved drug that for treatment of sickle cell disease and studies have shown that this um, decreases episodes of painful crisis, acute chest syndrome, in patients from needing frequent blood transfusions. And additionally, it's shown to decrease a person's mortality from sickle cell disease by 40%, which is great. Um, some side effects of hydroxyurea include chronic lowering of leukocytes, um, teratogenesis, so we don't want to give this to pregnant women, and potential for later development of malignancy. So. Some good, some bad news. 
Um, patients with sickle cell disease also require folic acid supplements daily, and this is to maintain the amount needed for increased erythropoiesis, or, yeah, erythropo um, yeah, erythropoiesis um, to counteract the effects of hemolysis. Red blood cell transfusions can be helpful and they can be highly effective in acute exacerbations of anemia. Um, also in the presence of severe complications from anesthesia or surgery, um, also in improving response to infection, acute chest syndrome, multiple organ dysfunction. Um, sometimes in pregnancy, blood transfusions can help to diminish episodes of sickle cell crisis. Um, overall, red blood cell transfusions can help to decrease complications from sickle cell disease because there's a higher volume of normal cells than the sickled cells. But transfusions have their own risks. Um, and as you know, we're in a worldwide um, blood crisis, so it's not always readily available. Um, so there can be complications from venous access. There can be infections like hepatitis, um, hemolytic transfusion reactions. Also iron overload. Um, so if we are getting blood transfusions often, they will have a higher concentration of iron, and this can cause deposits of iron into their organs and it can require chelation therapy. So we just helped them in one way and hindered it in the next way. And then we have supportive therapy, which includes oxygen, IV fluid hydration, pain meds, maybe in high doses, um, treatment of the infection with antibiotics, Incentive spirometry, we want our um, sickle cell disease clients to keep up with their vaccinations because they're at risk, increased risk for developing infections. We'll have physical therapy and occupational therapy on hand. Um, heat and massage may help with pain management. Behavioral and cognitive therapies for coping, resting, and then just good education surrounding the disease itself medications, and management. Okay, on to my favorite, G6PD. And this is, so G6PD, this is the gene responsible for this abnormality. And this gene would typically produce an enzyme within the erythrocyte that's necessary for stabilizing the cell membrane. And some people have um, this gene deficiency that is so severe that they have chronic hemolytic anemia, but others will only really develop hemolysis when under certain stresses or from certain substances like fava beans or menthol or tonic water, some Chinese herbs. So it's really interesting, um, this deficiency. Clinical manifestations typically Patients are asymptomatic until they are exposed to that um, substance that creates um, hemolysis. Um, they might have a normal hemoglobin or reticulocyte count, but after exposure to an offending agent, they'll present with paler jaundice, he um, hemoglobinuria, um, and on their blood smear, we'll see these Heinz bodies. Um, this is usually associated with toxic substance exposure. Um, which is in a lot of medicines, cosmetics, or food products. Interesting. So the management of screening tests can be done um, to diagnose G6PD, and treatment really involves discontinuation of the offending agent. Um, for those who have severe hemolytic cases, it might require a blood transfusion. So our nursing management will surround like education about the disease, substances to avoid, um, checking the, the provider before changing their medications. Um, they should check with us before taking over the counter medications. Um, and then they probably should wear a medic alert bracelet. All right, hereditary anemias. So hemochromatosis, this is a genetic condition that causes the client to absorb increased levels of iron from the GI tract gradually. And normally the GI tract absorbs about one to two milligrams of iron per day. 
but in hemo, uh, hemochromatosis, the rate is significantly increased, and the excess iron is then deposited into various organs, especially the liver, skin, and the pancreas. And this isn't good because eventually those organs will become dysfunctional. And since tissue damage with hemochromatosis occurs gradually, clinical manifestations don't occur until about middle age, where we see symptoms of weakness, lethargy, arthralgia, weight loss, um, tissue damage, endocrine damage, cirrhosis will kind of be later on stages. Um, cardiac arrhythmias and cardiomyopathy can occur with resulting dyspnea and edema. Um, also endocrine dysfunction, we can see hypothyroidism, diabetes, diminished libido, and impotence. Um, cirrhosis is also common in the later stages of the, of the disease due to increased deposits of iron in the liver. So lab values will show an um, elevated serum ferritin and high transferrin, um, but our CBC will typically be normal. Definitive testing can be done for the genetic mutation that causes this. Therapy will often involve the removal of excess iron, and this will be done with therapeutic phlebotomy, which is the removal of whole blood via ven venipuncture. And initially, this will be done weekly, um, like one unit of whole blood. And then as the ferritin level decreases, the frequency of phlebotomy will also decrease. Um, we'll also monitor the client's complete blood count to ensure that they're not becoming anemic with the therapeutic phlebotomy. And clients will be told to limit their iron intake through their diet and iron supplements, though this isn't enough to sustain a therapeutic ferritin level, um, it'll continue to rise. So they should be also advised to limit um, their vitamin C intake um, because that enhances iron absorption, um, but they will have to have therapeutic phlebotomy. They should also avoid alcohol consumption because it might impair their liver function when it's already working hard enough with those iron deposits. We want to monitor for organ damage, especially cardiac and endocrine, and then screening children of clients who are um, homozygous for the HFE gene. Last but not least, let's talk about inherited bleeding disorders. So our last two disorders are inherited bleeding disorders, so hemophilia and von Willebrand disease. So with hemophilia, there are two forms, A and B, which are clinically similar but different genetically when it comes to alterations in lab tests. So hemophilia A is caused by a genetic defect that results in deficient or defective factor 13. And this is a fibrin stabilizing factor and it plays a crucial role in the coagulation cascade by enhancing the stability of blood clot formation. Hemophilia B, also known as Christmas disease due to a genetic defect that causes a deficiency in factor nine. This is a protein produced naturally in the body and it helps blood clots to form our, yeah, blood clots to stop bleeding. It helps the blood clots form to stop bleeding. So when you hear the term Christmas disease, you might wonder if it's somehow related to the actual holiday, but fun fact, this is an alternative name for hemophilia B because of the first hemophilia B patient, five-year-old Stephen Christmas. Um, so hemophilia is often diagnosed early in childhood, so you might talk about this again in pediatrics as well as von Willebrand disease, but sometimes patients with mild hemophilia might not even be diagnosed until they experience a severe trauma or surgery later in life, and so that's why we're talking about it here in adult health. Um, so hemophilia is manifested by hemorrhages into various parts of the body, and these can be severe, and they can occur with minimal trauma. So spontaneous bleeding can occur frequently with severe factor deficiency. About 75% of the bleeding will occur into the joints, like the knees, elbows, ankles, shoulders, wrists, and hips. And the pain is noticed prior to the presence of swelling and limitation of movement. Um, recurrent joint bleeding can lead to joint arthro, um, arthropathy, and that can cause ankylosis and chronic pain. 
So the bleeding can be superficial and it can cause hematomas or it can be deep into the muscle or the subcutaneous tissue. Those hematomas superficially can cause nerve compression and impaired sensation. And then over time, they can lead to weakness and atrophy of the affected area. So just because bleeding happens more commonly, it doesn't mean that it's confined to the joints. Bleeding can happen with dental extractions or procedures. Um, patients can have spontaneous hemat hematuria and GI bleeding. They can have nosebleeds and then falls, um, especially fall leading to um, a head injury that can be um, a terrifying intracranial bleed. So we want to think about safety. So with a hemophilia diagnosis comes a lot of hardship coping because many times um, they'll be limited on their activity due to safety with bleeding concerns. And remember I said that this is normally diagnosed in children. So that is um, a very difficult process for the parent and the child. Um, one, the child cannot do normal activities that they would want to do and they don't understand why. And next, the parents have to, they'll probably have a lot of anxiety um, keeping their child safe from bleeding. So um, it's really our job as nurses to help them cope ask them to identify like positive aspects of this in their lives and then encourage independence and self-sufficiency and then just education on safety at home um, work if they're adults patients um, can be sent home with factor replacement concentrates and that um, can be administered at early signs of bleeding or prior to maybe going to the dentist um, but patients should be informed to avoid agents that interfere with platelet aggregation like aspirin, NSAIDs, herbal and nutritional supplements. <coughs> they should avoid injections and procedures that are necessary, wearing medical bracelets. And we can talk about genetic testing to adults who want to start a family who are at increased risk of um, giving it to a child. So last but not least, let's talk about von Willebrand disease. Von Willebrand. And this is another blood disorder in which the blood does not clot properly because they're developing, um, they're not developing von Willebrand factor properly and they have a decreased amount of factor eight, which helps platelets stick together during the clotting process. So clinical manifestations include slow, persistent bleeding. This can be from minor trauma or minor cuts. And it, uh, the bleeding tends to be mucosal, so like nosebleeds, bleeding after brushing the teeth. It can also be heavy menses, easy bruising, prolonged bleeding from cuts or minor injuries. So complications can include uncontrollable hemorrhage after dental extractions or irritation of gingiva, um, epistasis, GI bleeding, hematuria, um, things like that. Some diagnostic studies will be looking at their CVC, um, their clotting times, their factor eight, um, and then concentration of that von Willebrand um, factor antigen. So medical care, we obviously want to prevent or treat the bleeding, um, and we can do that re with replacement therapy. So there's desmopressin, which increases factor VIII coagulant activity, and it may also correct bleeding time. So it's helpful in situations to prevent bleeding with like dental or surgical procedures or managing mild bleeding. We also have amniocaproic acid. I think I said that right, um, can be effective in controlling bleeding for mild mucosal bleeding. It, inhibit, it, it inhibits the dissolution of the thrombus at the site of bleeding. 
And then when bleeding is more moderate to severe, really replacement therapy with von Willebrand factor and factor eight concentrates will be used. And this treatment may be for like seven to 10 days. So um, nursing interventions, health promotion, we wanna talk about genetic counseling, um, any acute intervention, we're gonna be controlling the bleeding. And then just education on when they should be seeking medical attention, proper dental hygiene for their condition, um, and no contact sports. We wanna prevent any cuts or injuries um, if we can. And then those medical or bracelets or tags. And that was it. So hope you enjoyed and I will see you in class. All right. Have a good day.